right. Put the big red button. Hey, Kevin. All right. So, welcome to security and governance in an IAC defined world. I have a lot of slides, and there's a lot of stuff to cover. I'm going to go real fast. If you have questions, please save them to the end. I will try my best to save room. <clears throat> but, uh, again, a lot to cover, a lot of topics here. You can get these slides and go through them on your own, and I'll be around camp the rest of the next two days to uh, happily answer any questions. And I'm always online. So, I always like to start out with what bad security actually looks like, and the absence of reason produces monsters. Uh, it's confusing. It's, security is constantly evolving, and it's easy to get really scared about what's there. And it's really lonely sometimes because you're kind of out on an island doing stuff that nobody else in the company is really focused on. And you're trying to say the sky is falling <clears throat> when the sky is in fact falling, but feels too long. And this is, what gar uh, this is what security feels like a lot of the time if you're working in it, especially at 3 a.m. When, why am I awake at 3 a.m. working on this? What does good security look like? It looks like you're sleeping at 3 a.m. Uh, no alarm bells are going off because you did it right. And it means you can leave areas that have Wi-Fi and connectivity to go do your the rest of your life. And you can spend time with the people that you love. Because at the end of the day, security is a people business. We get caught up in the bits and bytes and the, uh, the way that it all works together and threats and bombs and those kind of things. But at the end of the day, we are people protecting people and working with people to protect them. So that's what this talk is really, really about. Helping you make those better decisions to live a little bit better life and sleep a little better. The good news out there is we know how attackers behave. We can prepare for this. In fact, we know how attackers behave so well that MITRE wrote it down. The MITRE attack framework looks like this. Attack initial access and what they want is exfiltration. What they're trying to exfiltrate is your data because they want to ransom it back to you or sell it on the open market or do something else with it. Or they want your machine resources so they can do things like sell it on the open market. Uh, you can buy AWS instances for pennies on the dollar from the black market. Didn't know if you knew that, don't do it, it's illegal, but that's how the black market works. Uh, also, they want machine resources to spin up <clears throat> um, their own crypto mining operations. Monero, uh, Litecoin, Dogecoin, reason to show them. Oh, before I go any further, I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago, part of the MidCamp crew. I've been a developer advocate since about 2016. I've been in Drupal since 2013. Uh, I co-host a uh, podcast, the Security Repo Podcast. You can find me out there on the internet, various places. Let's talk about rock and roll and karaoke tonight. Uh, I work for Git Guardian. They'll come up later in this presentation, I promise. But this is what we do. We make secret detection and remediation. Uh, we do have an IAC misconfiguration scanning tool. That's really the heart of today's talk is that concept. But we do source composition analysis and public monitoring of GitHub as well. Happy to talk about that stuff too. I think it's important to understand how we got in this mess, in this boat, in the world, what I'm talking about. I'm taking a historical view of what on earth IAC even is, starting with waterfall. Uh, not that waterfall, that waterfall. Uh, when we talk about waterfall, we're talking about project planning. So we're going from we planned the thing, we modeled the thing, we constructed the thing, and then we handed it over to actually be run. And that's what this looked like inside of companies until eh, about 15, 20 years ago. But there was devs, and there was a fence that got everything thrown over to, and then there was ops. And then this happened, the DevOps revolution. About 15 years ago, uh, the DevOps handbook came out, the Unix project comes out. If you've not read these two books, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you're like, what does this have to do with IAC security? Everything. Because these are about getting things done faster in a better way. So we got the world of DevOps. And now instead of this linear thing that has a start and an end, we have a cycle that keeps going around and around and around where we iterate, where we and iterate. And we said, security's got to go somewhere. And we came up with DevSecOps where we put security literally everywhere. Except there's problems with that. Well, at the same time, we're going through that. We went for the personal revolution, uh, or the personal computer revolution, where we could put entire websites, entire infrastructure on small boxes, not these giant honking machines you have to buy and timeshare on. And then the cloud came around, and it changed everything. And we went from manually configuring these boxes of our own to manually configuring computers someone else owns in the cloud. And the interfaces look like this. It's called click, click ops. You go through and you click things and things happen. Nothing wrong with this for a CMS. Drupal, a user has got to do this stuff. But if you're setting up actual infrastructure, 
building the machines themselves, the virtual machines, the containers, this is slow and time consuming, and it doesn't scale. That's why they realized, wait a minute, these cloud provider dashboards are just, all the click ops is making configuration files. Why would we just let people write their own configuration files? But not just configuration files, let's let them declare their infrastructure state. There's a difference between a script and a configuration file, or in a state file. A state file says, this is reality, this is true. These are the things that are happening now, and I'm defining them. Not a top to bottom run, a list of truth. And that's what these tools do. Terraform, Pulumi, uh, AWS CloudFormation, OpenTofu, now the fork of HashiCorp. Um, Crossplane's a little bit different, but I'm still putting it on the list. And they say, I'll take this thing you wrote down and I will make this real. I will work through the interfaces within whatever system you tell me, AWS specific to cloud, or to AWS obviously, but we're gonna make these state configurations real. We're gonna throw all the buttons and do all the click ops for you. And we're gonna call that infrastructure as code. This is great because it lets us do this. Number of servers equals one or number of circles equals 48. You make one change and it magically does everything else. Well, not magically, but auto-magically, as Matt Cheney used to say, auto-magical. Uh, which is great because we can scale things up very, very, very fast. In fact, if you're a big fan of Pantheon and Acquia, uh, this is how it works. This is how they can go and give you an extra 100,000 page views a day for them, it's just adding a number. There's a lot of cogs and stuff happening behind the scenes, but it's just scaling up containers. The problem is, if you make a mistake in one, you made a mistake in all. Does anybody know why you're not allowed to do slash zero? You know what that means? Uh, that means you're allowing everything, all yeah, traffic, yeah. all traffic, just let everything <clears throat> in. If this is a Kubernetes cluster, that's really bad because containers, have their own set of concerns. And I don't know if you've ever dug through the security documentation for Kubernetes, but it has fun things like this. Security context, run as non-root, equals false. Wait, that should be true, shouldn't it? Yeah, uh, so you're letting everybody run as root. But that's the way it's all written. It's a little bit confusing and a little bit easy to like overlook things. And if this was the only line in the file, yeah, you catch it. These files tend to be hundreds of lines long, and they're dependent on other things in the file being built before they're built, and you're concerned about order of operation a little bit, and it's easy to overlook things like that, to the tune of go look on dark reading or uh, bleeping computer or any such news site about tech and security, and you're gonna see stories like this almost daily. So, that gets to the heart. That starts, that was my introduction. So we're gonna go through these three areas. Misconfiguration, access, and governance. If we can tackle these three things, we can knock out most all problems we're having with infrastructure as code from a security perspective, which is why I'm here. Misconfigurations. Thank goodness there's an organization out there that's 20 years old that has been doing everything it can in its power for the last 20 years to help us be safe. And they're called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. I think they changed the W to worldwide Double check that for me, but OWASP is still the acronym. Uh, I was just at DEF CON and they were in full force and it was delightful to be there with them in AppSec Village. Can't say enough good things. Anyway, they have this famous thing called the OWASP Top 10. This is ground zero 101 for how do I, be, uh, how do I make my application secure? Focus on these areas. Well, they also said if you're cloud native, which is what we're talking about with IAC, yes, you can deploy infrastructure as code within your own premises, within your own infrastructure, but you're basically just saying that server instead of AWS. You're saying this thing instead of Google Cloud. So I think this still applies even though it's cloud native because it's still infrastructure as code configuration. So that's what we're gonna walk through a little bit what these things specifically mean. So uh, your cloud container orchestration, Injection flaws, a problem with application. This, I, I, my eyes glaze over as I read this myself. So it's not just you. So what configurations, I think it falls into five categories to make it a little bit easier to grok. Networks, secure, or secrets, permissions, data, and other. Other being a fun, fun miscellaneous category of all the little things you can get wrong. This is the full extent of my graphical creation ability. So I hope you appreciate the, uh, fact that this is a realistic scenario and not an overall simplification. Um, 
So let's talk about network configurations first. Those configurations first. What goes wrong if your network isn't secure? Well, someone get it in your network. Once they're in your network, unless you have done authorization very, very, very tightly, that means they can get anywhere. So, common misconception: leaving remote access accessible from the internet, that slash zero, uh, increase your tech service. If I can get in from anywhere, I can get in from anywhere. If you limit it in scope to only the IPs you specifically have named and know, they have to get to those first. That's a much harder task. Uh, Key Vault has no network access control list. Uh, does anybody not know what a Key Vault is? Okay, happy to explain. I should have had a slide on that. So, Secrets Manager. A Secrets Manager is a Key Vault. A Key Vault is a Secret Manager. Vault technology, we, you're gonna hear it called a lot of different things, but Secret Manager is the proper industry term at this point. Uh, players like HashiCorp Vault, is the enterprise one. AWS, Google, Azure all have something built in. Azure has Key Vault, which is a really well documented thing. I like it a lot. And if you're 100% all in on that platform, uh, one of those platforms, use their key manager and you're good. If you're a cross platform, that's where enterprise vaults like HashiCorp Vault Enterprise or uh, Conjure or Achilles or uh, Doppler, they're on uh, Australia. Really good companies. But that's what they build. And Instead of putting your secret directly into your code base to say, this is the database credential you need, you put the database credential into your secrets manager and then it gets called in at runtime when it's needed. So the secret never leaves the secret manager. It's always encrypted at rest, encrypted in transport, and only loads into memory when, when you tell it to. That clear? We're all good there? Okay, but if you have a key vault that has no network access control list, you're basically saying ignore, ignore everything I just did. The key vault really can't function as it's supposed to. Um, but anyway, the rest of these are basically, we, may, we messed up with the network. All of these links, and that's why I'm sharing my slides with you, and at the very end I'll put the link back up, um, and I'll share them online, I'll put them in Slack. All of these items uh, link to specific definitions and what to do about it. But as you see, there's a lot of ways you can mess this up. Secrets misconfiguration. I guess I should have waited until here to explain secrets manager, but oh well, we did already did it. Putting your secrets out in public is bad. I'll get more into that later when we talk about access. Hopefully you all know that. Uh, again, this is something I learned back when I, I worked at Pantheon from 2014 until 2019. And when I first started working there, it really bugged me that I had to put all my environment variables in Pantheon's secret vault and I could never hard, they specifically say, do not hard code any database credentials or any other credentials into your code base itself or into your um, config, uh, oh, I, this, but into your config, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, settings.php, never put uh, hard code credentials straight up there. And I was bothered me when I first started, I was like, why not? And then the more I started using it, it's like, oh, I see why not, because that makes you very vulnerable to getting hacked. So use a vault. Um, ECR image scanning, uh, I don't remember what ECR stands for. Let me go actually go look at this one. Uh, Amazon ECR, it's a specific service. So anyway, there's a lot of things that can just go wrong with it, that's my point. Again, my eyes are starting to feel the same way yours are. Permissions and misconfigurations. This is the biggest one that people screw up a lot. Giving pseudo rights or letting people run as root. Using default service accounts. Service accounts bad. I've come to really firmly believe this in my life. We can have a whole conversation about service accounts bad, but uh, it's bad. Um, IAM policies uh, aren't set to remove root access keys. Uh, yeah, you know, basic stuff. Except there's a lot of it. Uh, data misconfigurations. Yeah, data too. CloudTrail buckets are, can be made public for accident. And that exposes all your logs. Uh, Data factory been publicly exposed. Yeah, I'm right there with you. There's a lot of stuff, and you're kind of feeling a little bit like, oh wow, overwhelmed. And then the other stuff, uh, unencrypted HTTP, HTTP access, port 80 instead of port 8080. Um, no SSL connection on SQL database might lead to data exposure because attacker in the middle. Uh, no denote encryption. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I should have just said encryption on this one, but it's it's a lot of other things beside encryption. I just picked on encryption because. 
its encryption. So that's a lot of stuff. And I don't expect anyone to walk out of here with a working knowledge of all that stuff, because that would be silly. More important, now that we've said how many things are we to do, uh, are who's to do it? Who's checking this stuff? Is this all on the dev side? Is this all on operations side, if you're still making that separation? Is it the DevOps team? Is it security? Who's sitting way over there as the department of no? Are they, are they the ones? I can't be security because of this. Alex Rice at HackerOne back at whew, Hack 2022, I don't remember the name of the event, off the top of my head, it's linked somewhere. Uh, almost all my links and notes are in the uh, speaker notes. Anyway, he said, on the best organizations, the security team's outnumbered 101. For every one person on your team, you probably have one security person. That doesn't scale. The only way we can truly, truly scale security is to make everyone part of the security team. Except that also has some drawbacks because not everyone's a security expert. Security, again, makes you read a lot of PDFs. It makes you look through a lot of configuration and worry about things and say the sky is falling a lot. And that's not what developers do. Developers develop things and get them out the door faster and we make people happy. So we can shift some things left from the security team and what Security used to just be a thing here in five, but has anyone here, is, is shifting left new to anybody in this room? You've never heard the term shifting left? Cool, you all know what shifting left is, good. So in the software development life cycle, shifting left for a developer goes somewhere around here. I think it's right before implementation myself, but I think we should ultimately try to shift left over here, but that's a whole other talk about moving left all the way to the whiteboard and having someone in security or at least a security champion in the room when you are starting to say, I want to use this data. I want to do this. I want to connect these systems. And someone can say, that's not probably a great idea. And here's why. And let me go check with the security team to double check. But I'm pretty sure we can't use that data. If we could have that conversation earlier, I believe the industry could save millions and millions of dollars and probably hundreds of thousands of hours a year. All right. So if we shift left, what does this mean from a tooling perspective? Oh, sorry. Got too far. It means these tools. So that laundry list of things I showed you already and where your eyes glazed over, you're like, okay, get your point. Um, yeah, you don't have to know those things because there are companies' entire mission, tools' entire mission to do these things. The first four I want to uh, mention are call out or open source. Kicks by check marks, free open source tool all your developers can run locally and it will do that check for them and make sure that before they make the commit, they don't have anything in there. Prisma Cloud works a little bit different. Our checkoff by Prisma Cloud is a little bit different. It's uh, web-based, but it's still open source. Um, it still has to the platform, but it's free. Uh, last I checked. I haven't actually checked that in probably four months. So I'm making an assumption. TerraScan by Tenable, definitely, definitely free. Um, and TFSec by Aqua Security. I should just put Aqua at this point. I've met them now, and they don't go by Aqua Security anymore. Neither Aqua. Anyway, uh, not Aquia. They're out there. Uh, anyhow, um, we make one of these at Git Guardian. Be honest with you, it's still in beta. We're still adding things to it. Ours only checks for about 100 uh, of the most common, and check marks and check off, kicks by check mark and check off are much more extensive. False positives are a thing in all of this. No tool is perfect, but I would much rather us spend an extra five minutes up front before we make the commit than deploy something that gets us breached. It works. All right. Question. Yes. So they, they're scanning your config file. Are they able to kind of like uh, look at the logic behind like inbound rules, outbound rules? All of it. All, all the stuff you just so all of that stuff is in the config file. So right. maybe I should have done that now that I'm thinking on it. Because last time I presented this was Southern California Linux so, Expo. So if, if the yeah. keyboard, for example, doesn't have the right role permissions, it's going to flag that? It's, it, because it needs to call that, it's not going to do, it's a static check. It's right. a static analysis, so it's not going to do a dynamic analysis and like find the flaw while it's running. Right, no, but it's going to, it can flag it and say, okay, yes, you yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, I can actually show, oh, I didn't set up a demo, dang it. Um, I can show that in action later if I have time. I will pull up a demo and show, we'll, we'll mess around with that and we can do that offline as well. Um, yes, but that's the whole point, is you're defining all of this in YAML or TAML or whatever system you're using, but YAML is the most common by far. And it's just looking at your YAML file and saying, hey, these things don't make sense. Right. 
hey, this shouldn't be, this should be zero, this, this shouldn't be, look like that. All right, so just to clear our brains a little bit, because I see some people very it's tired. Time for the it's time for the percolator. Just get up it's a second, I'm serious. Percolator. Get up, shake it off. It's time for the Go drop. Because the second half, the second half is a lot less eye roll. It's time for the percolator. Wait, what? It's time for the percolator. 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 Percolator. That's DJ it's Green. It's time for the percolator. That's DJ it's Green from uh, Chicago. That song's like 10, 15 years old. All right. So, misconfigurations. It's very boring. Use tools. Don't try to do it by hand, you will mess up because there's so much stuff and it's so overwhelming and it puts you to sleep while you're trying to do it. And we need to stay awake and do our jobs. Tools get you there faster. That's my entire point of the last 15 minutes. Access. Who can actually touch this stuff? IAC is interesting because it is defining a state that you're trying to get to. And depending on how you implemented it, the click out stuff still will probably work most of the time, which means if I've spent all the time and effort to scan and one person says, hey, I think it would work better if we did this and goes through the AWS interface and clicks a box and unclicks another box and you're, that doesn't get committed anywhere and doesn't get applied back to the plan, the Terraform plan, your YAML file, and that YAML file never gets reapplied and rebuilds that then you probably gonna have that security hole until you redeploy. So this is very important to think of who can touch the code and in what instances are they allowed to. This is very easy on one machine. This is very easy from one person. If you are one person doing IAC, this actually doesn't concern you, but that's not how, that's, you would probably never do IAC for these reasons. So you're always gonna have to worry about like, hey, what accounts actually have access to my IAC config? Because you're gonna store it somewhere. Probably in Git, we'll get to that in a second, but who, who has access to this in the org? Who is allowed to actually make approved pushes? Do we let anybody make changes? There's no right 100% answer to this, it's gonna depend on your organization. But just know that if team A has a decision of like, I need our infrastructure to work like this, and team B says, wait a minute, it works better for us if we do this on the same infrastructure, because we're both working on the same application, just different functions and parts that are in inside of it, microservices inside of this big application we built. And they don't talk to each other, they can start overriding each other. So we need a source of truth that can be, well, true. Who, who's actually in charge of what, and who can make these changes? Again. This is food for thought. This is not a 100% right answer. But I already made this point, sorry. But uh, yeah, are you, do you let people go in and touch the dashboards? Or are you very strict in your models to say, no, no one ever goes in and touches the click buttons. No, there's just, there's not an option to do that. How we implement that, I'll talk about in governance, but access is why we have governance and I think it's important to talk about this first. So, where do we store our IAC code? I would love to know. Who here actually builds infrastructure as code stuff? Anybody? I should have asked that earlier. Okay. Okay, so, uh, do you store um, the IAC configuration in the same repo that you store the actual code for the application? No, it tends to be different. Yeah, that's good. Um, but again, you're gonna be depending on your situation. We're in a world where it's still so new that we're not, there's, it's still in flux on what's the best practice. It's gonna be the best practice for you based on your situation and depending on how, again, you work with it. And if you're like, what IC code, then I think you're in the wrong talk, but you're welcome, welcome to stay. Basically, there's two approaches that you can do for the IC configuration itself. You can have an IC monolith. We all love monoliths, don't we? Uh, it's just one honking giant file. But you can also split that file up into as many subfiles as you possibly want and just reference it from main.tf, uh, main.terraform, or whatever. There's a thousand main conventions. But 
Point is, if it's monolith, it's very easy to say, nobody touched this one code. If you've scattered it out, especially cross team, that's the time to step back and say, all right, who has access to these repos? And would any module override another module? And you just need to start doing diffs and look for where cross hits are. All right, fun part. Uh, this goes back to secrets, but if you know who's making decisions in your code, then you can start tracking down like, hey, who has access to these secrets and are they putting them in places where they shouldn't? This is, again, a people problem. Machines don't write, them, write their own code. I mean, they can. You can make AI do anything. But a person working on this says, I didn't need to do this work for my team. I'm just going to hard code it in the, in the uh, Terraform file, and then we don't have to worry about the secret manager stuff, then it just works. And if one person slips it through in that config, we should all assume that our code is going to become public one day. We should all just assume that, because whether you want to or not, that's been proven time and time again, leaks happen. So how often does this happen? How more common is that people just do that? That's the question. Git Guardian puts out a report every year, state of secret sprawl. In 2023, for those of you who know the answer, do not answer. Uh, for everyone else, how many secrets do you think we found on GitHub? Secrets being defined as an access key, a password, anything that grants access to a third party system or another system connects two like, machines together or encrypts or uncrypts data. Uh, we'll go by prices right rules and I have a prize of no value. So for government people listening, there's a no value prize. It's just something I handmade that I think is special. All right, so guesses. Just start raising your hands and shouting out. 5,000. 5,000. 100,000. 100,000. Oh, come on, people, you got nothing to lose. Come on, we got two guesses. How many? 700,000. 700,000? Come on, this is for a prize of no value. <laughs> 1 million. 1 million? 250K. 250,000? All right, let's call it now because so, well, can I call it now? Um, <laughs> Here you go. Here's an octopus I made on the plane. Uh, I appreciate it. You can have it. Uh, because the answer is 12.778 million. Yeah, this isn't cumulative. This isn't of all time. This is just added in the year 2023. One of the things Git Guardian does with our public monitoring is we look at every new commit that hits Git Hub uh, public and every new is public event, which is the event in the API where something that was private became public. The year before that, we found a little over 10 million. The year before that, we found about six and a half million. The year before that, we found uh, two and a half million. Part of that's us getting better, but also part of it is because it used to be one in 12 committers committed a secret every year, then it was one in 10, and now we're just about one in seven. It's getting worse, not better. Have that conversation with your teams. Um, if that report is completely free, no sign up needed, just go to that Get Guardian State of Secret Sprawl report, download it, won't even ask for an email. All right, that sets the stage for the last piece. Governance. Governance in IAC is a new field. What I'm telling you, I have learned from people that are building it as they go inside of the cloud native security community, um, inside of the uh, Kubernetes community, and some of these are opinions. In fact, they're all opinions. But they're all driven by everything else we just talked about. And it basically, governance model answers this. How do you manage what ISC invokes and under which conditions? When are you allowed to do a thing? When are you not allowed to do a thing? That's what governance is. Do it or don't. It ties in with access, but I see access as a slightly different human problem versus the machine problem. How do you know if AWS can do it? Well, there's this beautiful, wonderful open source tool that is free and everybody should know about. It's called Open Policy Agent. And it's a giant JSON file. And it says, this is the conditions where these things can happen. If it doesn't meet these conditions, don't let it happen. You can do this in IAC, and it works very, very well until you start experimenting until you start needing to make changes. If you're set in stone, OPA is your best friend. It's really good for established, clear-cut rules. If your entire mission is like, let's prevent unwanted access by any means necessary, 
that set all those rules were good, walk away. But if you're like, I want to innovate, I'll rapidly innovate on stuff, and I'm going to be in uncertain situations. Uh, I don't need the agent to block me because I want to get through it first, and then we'll worry about the agent later when we actually go to production. Open PA is bad. The problem with uh, and the, the problem with using OPA too early is it blocks innovation. But the reason uh, you want to use some kind of tools for governance in the development process is you just don't want developers to go willy-nilly and then you have a bunch of security problems because then we're right back to waterfall. We're right back to blocking everything in the end and stopping the innovation and stopping the feedback loop. We want the innovation to go into production as fast as possible. So we need to account for that. How the industry is settled to do this are two ways, but both involve human in the loop. The first is there are these platforms, Terraform pull request automation platforms. One's called ENV0. I don't never use them, but I like their people. I've met several other team. Lannis is an open source tool that basically manages pull requests for you at certain juncture points in the process. Then there's GitOps. That's the other one. Is anybody here not familiar with GitOps? Okay, GitOps is a, again, fairly new term. It's only been in the few, last few years. But uh, I'll go back to that slide in a second. But it has four overriding principles. You can just go to open GitOps.dev. Flux and Argo, that's the Argo little guy, um, are both free open source tools that they want you to use. It's declarative. You are stating the state of, just like you do for your infrastructure, you're stating the state of everything. This is our declared state of the world. A step beyond IAC, it's like where our code lives, who has access, where the secret manager is. All of the things around your IAC config is declared. It's version and immutable. You do everything via Git, no exceptions. That's why it's GitOps. Immutable means you never make a change directly to a file that hasn't gone through the process. There's no hot fixes in GitOps. People do, they shouldn't. That breaks the GitOps model and breaks the promises. Because if you do it that way, all the automation kicks in properly and things get pulled in that you don't have to worry about it. I pushed my code, it passed, GitOps got it from here. This last one is the most important piece. Remember earlier I talked about you go in and you make a click ops configuration and it says, and, and then you didn't redeploy and now you have stuck with this setting on this one, this one server, this one instance where someone clicked opted. These tools have polling mechanisms that go and say, did anything change? Are my ends still in the same state? Oh, this isn't in the same state? Reapply the same state. Destroy the environment if I have to. You can set it at multiple levels, but continuously reconciled means we will always be in the declared state that you versioned and declared as immutable. Obviously, I prefer this model to this model, but there's no right answer. The fundamental difference between the two of them, because they both agree on the fundamental principles that you shove your code into Git, Git triggers the thing, CI CD runs, and it spits out the other end. They both agree with that. The difference is this, and this is a slide from a talk from my buddies over at Kube First. Uh, there's a link to it at the bottom, and you can watch the full talk. And it's literally one of the first talks I know of about this entire concept. So. I am at my tippy toes at the edge of the water because this is a fairly new field, last year or so. But the difference between IAC, like Atlantis, and GitOps, like where you straight up talk to Crossplane, which is the mechanism of the actual communication to, that's too much in detail, but this is their slide, not mine, um, is where you put the human in the loop. At what point does someone up, approve the merge request? And it's a little esoteric. Because do you plan and apply? Or plan review and reply? Do you build a feature branch, review that, and then merge, and then plan and apply? And you may be thinking, that's very subtle. And it is. But again, we're on the bleeding edge right now. We're leading edge, I guess. Which is right for your team? I don't know. There's not 100% clear. The important thing is a human is in the loop. Right now, just think, I don't want an answer, because everybody's gonna be different, and it's a rhetorical question, but everybody think, if a developer on my team introduces a new secret, a new um, API key to a new system, 
what's the process to get that approved to go to production? Most people I talk to have no idea. They've never thought about it. Some teams are like, no, only the security team can approve those keys. I love those people, but they move very slowly. Somewhere in the middle is someone that's got enough acumen, technical acumen and security knowledge that they can say, all right, yes, this is a good idea. Or, hey, you're gonna hard code that, do not do that, let's get that out of the code base right now, rotate the secret and go use our vault. That's what you want to happen. But what you really wanna do is the developer just do it right in the first place, so you just hit approve, everybody wins. So, in conclusion, I said I got a lot of stuff. There are three big areas if you're gonna do IAC that you need to step back and really think on. The first one is actually really straightforward. You just have a tool that tells you you misconfigured this thing. There's a lot of them out there. I'm not gonna tell you which one's best, but we make one, but actually I would use the others because they're open source if I were you. First, unless you're a Git Guardian customer, then we'd love for you to use ours. It's just in beta as of 2024, August 14th. Yeah, there's the tools. No particular order, but based on what I just said, I think you know the order. Um, to have a conversation with your team, raise the awareness across the board. Who has access to this stuff? Why would you touch this stuff? If you never had that conversation about IIC and you kind of just threw it over the team and like, hey, we're gonna do IIC stuff now, make Terraform happen, good luck, and shut the door behind you. The analogy I always like is if you walk into a kitchen with someone that doesn't really know how to cook and put a bunch of ingredients down and say, all right, bake me a cake and just walk out, it would be sheer madness to think you would walk back in and a beautiful cake would be waiting on you. However, if you sat down with that person and says, here's exactly what I want to happen, and here's the best practices on making a cake. And here's all the tools. And if the training is over there, and there's YouTube if you really need it, uh, and I'll be back in an hour to check on you, and let's see how the cake comes out. We'll make it together. You're probably gonna end up with a cake. Maybe not the exact one you wanted, but close enough. It'd be edible. And finally, where does a human have to get involved in approval processes and in a world of immutable code? At some point that code becomes immutable and you can't change that version anymore. And it means you're gonna to have to make a new version of that code. Just a code update, it's just maybe change one character. But you're gonna to have to make a new version. That's gonna cause a new deploy. Can you do a new deploy? How fast can you do new deploys? In a perfect world, constantly, never an interruption. We live in reality though. Getting it right when the human's involved to do the PR process, super important to all this stuff. Because at the end of the day, we want to sleep better. We want to be humans. Humans talking to other humans. I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago. Check out the Security Repo podcast. There's a few more episodes coming out. I think a new one's supposed to drop today. I don't post those. I just do the show. And uh, yeah, that's it. There's my slides. <laughs> Any questions? We've got no, a few minutes for questions. Yeah, sure. You said you were at the Pantheon right before. So, I did. for example, how do they how do they like lock down the UIs for the to prevent all that kind of click bullshit going on when people go in and misconfigure stuff? Uh, that's why you can't touch the underlying you containers. Like, they don't, only certain people can that's what you're paying. That's literally what you're paying for is them to handle all of that stuff. Right. So if you're on them, the only thing you really need to worry about out of all of this is what you're doing with your secrets. But on, internally on that, for the oh. how do they lock down? I haven't been there since 2019. I have no idea how it was changed since I was there. Right. And this, again, this is stuff I'm talking about. Governance is all bleeding edge right now. I wouldn't even be able to guess what they're doing internally. I haven't talked to anyone that works internally. That's panel. a good question for their booth, honestly. Are you basically actually asking their sort of partners with those guys? Are, we, are you basically looking to ban people from having UI access? Well, that's the thing. You don't have UI access. You have no control of an INI yeah. file. You have no control of the underlying server mechanism itself. You can tell you can tell Pantheon to ramp up your RAM, you can tell Pantheon well, to ramp I mean, up your container. So I was like an internal, an internal team. Yeah, 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 and that's what I'm saying. I'm just, I, I work to marketing, man. <laughs> uh, or a function of mar I'll, marketing I'll, I'll, over I'll, there. I'll, I'll just, I'll I, I know um, uh, Michelle Creasy, when she was there, she's long gone too, uh, she had built like a bunch of this stuff by hand. She might have built a grub other thing at the, in 2018. I don't honestly know though, um, and I wouldn't want to mislead. But I do know 
they're a solid platform that is rock solid, but the trade-off is you don't lose that control, but then you don't have to worry about any of that because that's what you're literally you're paying them to worry about all this stuff. But again, but except for this, the secrets part, your database credentials are your database credentials. Pantheon will naturally make them for you and store them for you, and that'd be an awesome thing to have. And that's what their secret vault is all about. You can do all sorts of variable things. There's a really good Pantheon vault that will just inject things at runtime when the website is deployed. And it works, and it's great. I've been using it for years now. Um, but outside of that, yeah, if you're just going like a company that takes care of it, that's why you're paying them to take care of it. This is for if you want to go deploy your own. I think it's the best value for this talk. I maybe should have started with that too. In terms of keeping the infrastructure code in, within the application repo versus a separate repo, yeah. which one in your experience supports that? Whew. Define better. Like that's the problem. That's the problem. Easier to maintain. Not more secure. It depends on, and I hate to say it depends so much, but if your team is used to working in mono repos, then it's going to be a mono repo and trunk based development, and like it's all one thing. And that's how your team's going to think about it. From a pure um, security standpoint, it, it really doesn't matter. It's harder to, it, it, but from a threat perspective, like the number of attack surfaces you have matters. So if you have one repo, there's one thing to guard. If you have 15 repos, there's 15 things to guard. From, but if your team, on the other hand, is really used to working with microservices, and a single application is made up of 30 repos, and you're really used to that model, make a 16th repo, or a 32nd repo, or whatever, and make that a separate thing. Again, it depends on how your team is used to it. Whatever they're more used to defending, and whatever most success defending, do that. But again, there's no hard, fast rule on this. Again, because this stuff is still an emergence. If Pantheon invented container, they were the third company that made a containerized product on Earth. Uh, they were the biggest on metal server deployment of containers in the history of Rackspace. And then they were the biggest thing that ever went into Google Cloud and containers when they moved. Uh, so they've been doing that for a while. Um, I do know they do not use mono repos. <laughs> they, I, knew that, I know that fact. Where everything is uh, separated out into concerns. All right, well, those are the slides. Enjoy the rest of DrupalCon, DrupalGovCon, and I will go rest my voice and hit the big red button. Thank you very much. Thank you.